Okay, so recording started already. Awesome. So I told us today we'll be talking about uh, the God, which actually is the is with with that in UK that face is not looking familiar. How many certificates I've had? Yeah, she has many devices. Oh, okay. She has many devices. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I said we'll be talking about uh, the God and uh, how that affects everything. Um, it affects a whole lot. Well, I'm not sure to string it right now. My computer has been, it's really complaining that I'm overusing it. Yeah, it's been overworking a lot. So, um, a whole lot, the, one of the, I would say one of the areas of research of so great interest in uh, finding cures to so many conditions has been on the relationship between the gut and various aspects of the human body. Um, one, of the, one of the research or one of the uh, developments I found very outstanding is the role of the gut in reversing or in managing uh, kids who have uh, issues of autism, Down syndrome, and the likes of them. Uh, in the last couple of uh, months, um, I have quite a number of them. And then the improvement has been very remarkable. Very remarkable. I remember about, um, that'd be about five, six years ago, um, the first case of autism that I that we handled, it was such a surprise to the parents and everyone just because we just handled, we, we took a few things here and there. The difference in the result, what the parents experienced was far more than what they had experienced in almost eight years of managing that child, running the child, head as sketcher and things like that. And we were able to do this simply by tweaking a few things to help the gut in its functions. And so uh, after that, a whole lot has, has happened. A whole lot of uh, research has gone on, discoveries have happened. Uh, many, many things have been discovered about how the gut influences virtually everything uh, that has to do with our well-being. And so we'll be studying that today, uh, uh, understanding your gut health. If your gut is healthy, your overall body is going to be healthy. If your gut is not healthy, there is nothing you do. It's just going to amount to like you are not doing anything yet. That next slide. Okay. The body microbiome consists of over 100 trillion bacteria. Uh, when you want to look at that in ratio, that's going to give us like one to one. For every one cell of the human body, it's almost likely that there is also one bacteria. It's like a familiar spirit assigned to every cell of the human body. So every cell, I mean, we just use that analogy anyway, ratio one to one because there are about 100 trillion cells in the human body, and then there are about 100 trillion bacteria also living in the human body. So we call this the microbiome, which talks about the community or the environment of um, microorganisms. We have bacteria, we have protozoas, we have fungi. All of these play a whole lot of role in the gut. And so scientists have come up to say the gut is like the second brain of the human body, which to me 
is a very key word, strong word, especially while dealing with children with cognitive uh, disorders. So I want to believe that if the one up here is 40, God in his wisdom has created one down, which is like an auxiliary. So you can use the auxiliary to jumpstart or kickstart the one that is 40 up there. And that is what I have been doing in the last couple of years, and it's giving so much results. And so, I mean, for me, it's one of the, I mean, if anybody asks me, you people losing weight, you have no problem. You are enjoying life. <laughs> the people that are, I feel so touched and concerned when I see those kids that have potentials to be all they could be, but because of um, certain uh, birth defects, they are unable to fulfill that mandate. Right, so it's, such a, it's, it's so exciting for me when I see changes, when I see improvements, when I see developments that the medical sciences have termed impossible, like if it never happened, oh, this child will never be able to do this, he will never be able to learn, he will never be able to do this on his own. And it's being reversed right in our very eyes, just because we decided to tap onto the second brain. Now, where is that second brain? The second brain is, um, is not, um, it's not in the skull. The second brain is here. And then, you know, oftentimes I refer to it as in your stomach, but it's much more than the stomach, right? Because the gut is, uh, is a gastrointestinal tract. And the gastrointestinal tract starts even from your mouth and runs through the, the rectum where you pass out fecal material, stools, and the likes of them. And so it's a whole large portion comprising of several organs. So it's not just an organ that is involved. You have some organs, you have tissues, you know, that are involved in what is called the gastrointestinal system. And so all of that combined together is what we refer to as the gut. And uh, you will also believe or agree, if I give you a few examples, uh, people who are falling in love, they say that uh, they have butterflies in their tummy when they fall in love or they fall out of love, whichever happens. But there's, a, there's, an, there's an incident I always want to refer to. I remember while growing up, uh, something happened. Right? Um, something happened in the middle of the night. And then I, I mean, we were all terrified by what, what had happened. And in the, in, the, in the space of about 20 minutes, everybody was rushing towards the bathroom to use the toilet. <laughs> like, <laughs> Something forced everybody at that moment that you have to go and empty your bowel. Um, fear sometimes is expressed from your stomach. You feel ache. I mean, uh, I've had people say somebody is talking and what the person is saying is stomach aching. Like, it's irritating, but they feel it in their stomach like a bug. That suggests or means that the stomach has a mind of its own. That is what the, the late man will interpret it to be, but I will explain what is going on there in the course of this class. Uh, because it's more than having a mind of his own. Uh, but I'm only trying to say that we express emotions, emotions of fear, from within our stomach. There are times that we we'll express emotion of joy. You know, uh, like I always say to people that every culture has gotten a science. Any culture that does not have a science is yet to evolve. The, the, the question will now be whether the science was, you know, created, genuinely invented by the people of that culture, it was borrowed or it was stolen. There are stolen sciences, there are borrowed sciences, and there are those that were invented by the, uh, originally by the culture that owns them. But every culture has brought in a science. And so I'm saying this because I want to say something right now in my own culture, when somebody is happy, they will say that if you ride, if you ride on a horse in my stomach, that horse will not have any issues. Why? Because it's like in their stomach, the road is paved, well tarred, there are no potholes there. I mean, I believe some of us understand what that is. I don't want to say it in Yoruba because of people who don't speak that language, but people who are from that part of the world, that speak that German language understand what I just said now, right? They will say, if you, if you ride on a horse in my stomach, you won't have any issues. 
because they believe that at that time when they are joyous and happy, they are excited, it's like they, com they compare the state of their stomach with a paved, a well paved and tarred road without potholes, right? It's also an indication of the fact that they have been able to be scientific enough, that culture is scientific enough to understand that some emotions are best expressed, not from here, but from here, from the tummy. And this is what I'm trying to say. So the gut is like the second brain in the human body, which is what science is now waking up to. Some of the realities we are dealing with right now, that science is bringing to us, are realities that our forefathers have been using 80 years, 100 years, 150 years back. But they told us it, it was voodoo and juju, so we abandoned them. It has taken sciences almost 100 years to come by all those discoveries. For example, the one we are doing right now, all of us are meeting online now. I tell people that in those days, only witches can meet online. Um, <laughs> you, you are standing in front of your PC. In, in those days, our forefathers, how were they called? Oyela. <laughs> and then when they say, <laughs> disappear and appear, you will hear on the screen, and you, they will have conversation. Isn't that, com that's telecommunication, right? But, you know, we believe it was all evil, and then we threw it off. We threw everything away. And then we, I mean, it has taken sciences almost 70 years to catch up, if not more, to catch up with what those people knew in those days. Many of them died, and they died with all of those inventions that somebody could have studied, find out the science behind it. Like I said, every culture has gotten the science. And that was their own science. But to a particular culture, that science was voodoo, right? And now they have forced their own sciences on us, and we are buying their own sciences, paying for it heavily. Not only in terms of money, we are paying with our time, we are paying with our health, we are paying with our court. We are, I mean, all of these screens before us right now, if you will know the amount of radiation that these screens are generating and entering to our bodies, our children are also paying for it, right? And so um, they have been wise enough to understand what the human body deals with. Uh, in their own primitive, I don't want to call it primitive anyway, in their own way or in their own understanding, all right? So let's look at the gut. And that is a picture of what it looks like. And like I said, it does start from the mouth. Um, and I will explain because that, for me saying it starts from the mouth has some significance which I would, I would not want us to overlook. A whole lot of people overlook the significance of what starts, what happens, from the mouth. So it extends from the mouth to the pyloric sphincter up to the stomach to the anus and then it goes to the small intestine to the large intestine and that is a whole lot of work that goes on there. When food comes into our mouth, digestion as a matter of fact starts from the mouth as we will discover or we'll see later on and that food when when food escapes certain activities from the mouth and jumps into the esophagus, which is the throat, the food has escaped or has omitted one vital important part to initiate digestion. Uh, so that is where the gut starts from. There are times, I wouldn't know, if you have ever used certain medications before that you apply probably orally, uh, no, no, not orally right now, you apply them topically. Uh, for example, maybe eye drops or hair drops. When you apply them, you feel the taste in your tongue. Not even in your stomach right now. You feel the taste right there in your tongue. Of course, that those are also connected in one way or the other. There's a connection between the eye, the nose, the tongue, the ears, and there's a, they have a connection. But there are times that uh, the, the tongue from, from, from the mouth the saliva secretes certain enzymes from the glands in the mouth. This, this uh, secretion sometimes do not commence because food is in the mouth. They commence, I mean, it commences just by the mere sight or the mere thought or the mere uh, um, smell of food. Right, that is the connection I'm trying to make with uh, applying certain stuff topically. For example, you could be thinking of, if you are from Ekiti, if you are an Ekiti man, yeah. Ekiti people love pounded yam a lot. And so, if you have missed pounded yam in a long time, the mere thought of you 
going home that as you are going home today, what you are going home to have is pounded yam. Just the thought of pounded yam begins the secretion of certain enzymes in your mouth. That secretion starts. Sometimes it starts by the sight of the food. You just see the food. You may not know it, uh, but of course you will know it. Some people begin to salivate. You begin to, mm -hmm. um, you're going to see the, um, some things coming up from the saliva in your mouth. They begin to show up like that. Why? There is a correlation. Now, that is what we call the gut and the brain connection. Something that signals something in your brain and it's telling, that, telling your saliva I and mean, telling your mouth to begin to secrete certain stuff from your saliva glands. And those stuff that are being secreted are required for digestion to take place. Now, when you put that, that um, uh, so I don't want to use the word swallow right now, when you put that food in your mouth and then you do not masticate it properly, you do not chew properly, and what we call swallow in Africa or in Nigeria especially, and you just put it in your mouth and you swallow it. The food has omitted, it has missed or escaped the very first point of digestion. Now you see the reason, when you see many people talk about weight management, they will tell you, oh, ah, Nigeria, all our foods are carbohydrates. I have debunked one by telling you that there is nothing wrong with our food. When somebody says it is carbohydrate, that is not the reason for people uh, gaining weight unnecessarily and not being able to, you know, to undo their weight. It is not because our diet is mainly carbohydrate because our body needs carbohydrate. Our body requires carbohydrate to perform several functions in it. It is not because of that, but because of the fact that most of the carbohydrates we consume have been processed. So because they have been processed, they are not good for the body to digest. That is one fact. And today, again, the second fact is the way we even eat the carbohydrates. We call them swallow. And so when you chew them in your mouth, you don't even masticate or chew them. You just mm, swallow them. <laughs> and as they are swallowing them, their tummy is increasing. They are wondering what is going on. It is not the food. It is your method of eating them. And so we will discover in this class that you are not supposed to just swallow any food. No food is, is a swallow. The only thing you swallow is water. <laughs> Drink. Masticate the food. Chew it. Let it mix with the sal I mean, uh, with your saliva because there are glands there that contain enzymes. And these enzymes are to initiate the process of digestion before it goes into your esophagus. But because of our culture, now look at culture there. Because now people begin to blame things on genetics, not knowing that some, so many things are functions of habits, behaviors, behavioral patterns. And these patterns continue from one generation to another. You, have, you, you must have seen parents who smack their kids and say, why is your mouth making noise? The boy is doing the right thing. The mouth is supposed to make noise. <laughs> No, it's not. <laughs> not the ugly noise, anyway. There are some noises that are irritating. But in, in, in the, in the, in the, because we are forming like Oyibo people, who we'll have a different diet from ours. They could eat their meat without you hearing anything, anyway. But your own food, you have to make noise with your mouth. <laughs> so what? We, we smack the child and say, your mouth is making noise. What should it make if no noise? Something is there. It should be chewed. We have seen parents who smack the child and say, swallow it, why are you chewing? You are chewing ever. Why should you? You don't chew ever, you swallow it. How do you swallow it? It's hard sometimes. It took me a lot to If I was growing up, I disliked everything from swallow. Because I dislike the process. I dislike the way they even pre present them. So, <laughs> up till I was, I think up till I was about 21 or 22, my mother even never believed I could eat anything swallow. Because I began to feel that I'm allergic to swallow. Like, like, so, so she keeps saying every out of everybody in my house too. Well, mm -hmm. I just mm -hmm. disliked it. And you know, many of our kids too are disliked some of our food because of the way we force them to eat them. And it's somebody's mic that is making noise. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that person is. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow I'll show you to sir. I don't know who that mic is. Okay, I muted it. I don't know who, G who, who is G6. I don't know who G6 is. Anyway, we are going to resolve all of that. Our admission is going not to be. We will be posting links on the pages anymore. We will be sending the links via emails to registered people that we have them that should be in the class. 
you know, so we control all of that. I don't know what G6 is. I've not even seen G6 in, on this, on any of our trend of Zoom before. Okay, and people are hacking into Zoom sessions now. Somebody will just hack in and post pornographic stuff and all of that. So a lot is happening on, on Zoom these days. Okay, so, so we we'll call it again, the name we give it is the enteric nervous system. So it's, it's not like the coordinating nervous system, it's the enteric nervous system, and then I've just told you the thing it does. And this is a correlation. It has two thin layers of more than 100 million nerve cells lining up the tract from your mouth wow. to your rectum. So you see the correlation. That is why you feel those things you feel. Like when you want to ex express the emotions of fear, you can express them through them because there are nerve cells that connect to the central nervous system. There are nerve cells in your gastrointestinal tract that connect to the central nervous system. So you could express fear, you could express anger. Some people can be angry and they, and they will feel it in their stomach that they're angry. So people can be afraid, like I showed you, I mean, I, I, I disclosed in that example, oh, I mean, something, something serious no. happened and people were just rushing to the bathroom. Not, not because they ate um, some food with diarrhea, you know, but, but because of the fear, everybody was shocked and traumatized. So that trauma made everyone to rush to the bathroom you at the same time. It. Why? It's that thing is hard. It's good there. If you fell off, you were playing with it. But I don't know what you were doing after. The gastrointestinal tract has, it has um, uh, nerve cells that are in its lining. Okay, so I just tried to mute everybody who is making noise. So it has nerve cells that are in its lining. Okay, so the gut microbiome is a complex and dynamic population of microorganisms. It, call, it contains, uh, like I said, it contains uh, protozoa, it contains fungi, bacteria, and they are all there. Uh, I, I miss this, I miss this split a lot. Uh, a lot of this, I miss this split a lot. We use this split to culture in microbiology in our microbiology lab. So this is what we use in culturing microorganisms. So we put them, uh, it will stay for like 48 hours. They will now study the movement of microorganisms that will have grown, you know, under the microscope. We look at their shape, we look at their structure. That will tell us the name of the microorganism. We match with what is already existing. This will also help us to, uh, to, I mean, to determine what kind of microantibiotics that will be functional in the case of microbial, I mean, bacteria uh, infection and stuff like that, right? And then one, one of the things that these microorganisms do is the fact that they help the body to maintain homeostasis. Homeostasis is that perfect state of health, that we call, that not perfect, right? but that's called the balanced state where everything is in balance. The pH is in balance, acidity is not too much, alkalinity is not too much, the electrolytes are in balance, the body temperature is being maintained, the level of uh, toxicity in the body is, is not beyond what the body can tolerate at any particular point in time. The body is able to manage those things. That is a state of homeostasis and disease is controlled. When this is, I mean, because of, uh, of, of our microbiome and because of these uh, microorganisms uh, that are present in the, in the human body. So I will quickly run through the effect of the gut on the human body. Number one is the immune system development. Um, it, now, there is, um, there is something called GALT, G-A-L-T. It's an acronym that talks about the fact that 75%, 75 of what makes up the immune system is found in the gastrointestinal tract. And so, whether somebody is going to be now having, you know, uh, uh, an infection or not, will be so largely dependent on the health of the gut. And there are people who come up with allergies and all of that. All of this can be a result of an unhealthy gut. So you could be doing many things, using antibiotics. Once that is not healthy, immunity will be compromised. When immunity is compromised, it will be impossible to prevent a world of infections. There will be so many infections in the human body because the gut health has been compromised, meaning that you could have more good bacteria than bad bacteria. Again, let me say this, that it is not all the bacteria that are there that are good, and it's not all the bacteria that are in the body that are bad. Some are good, those are the bad boys, and some are bad, the bad, the, uh, I mean, the bad guys. What we want to ensure is that we do not have 
bad bacteria, more than the good bacteria, or bad bacteria begin to grow in the, at a rate that the immune system of the body cannot challenge them or stop them from replicating or from spreading. Because when that happens, the cell or the body itself begins to uh, uh, find a way to survive. In that survival mode, mutation can occur. It is mutation that leads to cancers and the likes of them, which is something we want to avoid. So we want to maintain homeostasis, which is a balanced state of health where we have the good bacteria. They are not disturbing anybody. I mean, the bad bacteria are not, I mean, they are not in a proportion that will be harmful and too terrible for the body to manage. And the good bacteria are also there doing their work and the things that they're supposed to do, which is one, the immune health, Number two is that they prevent infection. Number three is nutrient acquisition. Now, when food goes into the mouth, like I've explained the process of digestion starting from the mouth, and you have food uh, digested starting from the mouth, it goes into the esophagus, and all of that also, there are also other enzymes and secretions that are going on uh, right there. Uh, that Those secretions uh, are meant to hit digestion. They are meant to help the body to, to convert that food into a form that the body can use properly. All of this happens in the gut, all right? And so from the esophagus, the food goes into the stomach. From the stomach, in the, in the, I mean, uh, there, the, there is something called uh, chyme that is formed, meaning that the food is mixed with a whole lot of um, secretions. It's like a semi-liquid, uh, semi-solid substance at this stage. Now, at this stage, the stomach filters, mixes it up, passes the food to the small intestine. In the small intestine, separations begin to occur. Right there, within the walls of the intestine, the body, uh, the body begins to take the nutrients off from the food. The small intestine is divided into three parts, right? And then in those three parts, the duodenum, the jejunum, the helium, I don't want to bother you with all those medical diagrams, right? <laughs> the, the body begins to filter the food right from there, begin to take out the nutrients from there. It has left the stomach now. It is now in the small intestine. The small intestine is the most, I won't say the most, because they're all very important. But if anybody's going to do anything with uh, getting nutrients, losing weight, adding weight, all of this happens in the small intestine, which is where the body absorbs all the nutrients absorbable from the food substances that have been passed from the mouth down to the uh, esophagus, to the stomach, that is now in the end of the small intestine. From the ileum of the small intestine, passed through, through to the large intestine, whatever food has been able to pass from the small intestine to the large intestine is considered, I mean, as waste. Because at that time, it means the food could not be, I mean, whatever particle is left, let me call it food now, whatever is left, at the point it gets to the ileum, which is the third part of the small intestine, it means that food can no longer be processed. It couldn't be processed. It couldn't be, no nutrient is found there anymore. Whatever is left there can be considered as waste. So it moves to the large intestine. The large intestine is also is having about three colons there. You have the ascending, the transverse, and the descending colon. All of these have a role to play because from the ascending colon, the food goes back to the transverse colon. In that transverse colon, because that one is transverse, because it runs across the body. Now, you can see, now, there is no, there is no, there is no pumping machine pumping the food, going through all of these processes. In fact, the ascending colon, the food is going back from, is going from bottom up. It's going from bottom up. I will discuss why people have heart bombs and acid refluxes with this explanation because it all has to do with gut health right so it's going back up in, 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 in an ascending order there is no pumping machine you will all agree with me that for water to flow from one low level to a high level a sufficient level of pressure must be applied or be supplied from somewhere that is why you need a pumping machine but there is no pumping machine in all of these processes all of these processes are all stimulated by enzymes, by secretions from within the body, right? And so in that transverse motion as well, that also takes place. But I will now tell you something that happens, which is the work of the muscles, which is why where exercise comes in. 
because muscles do not, they don't, they are, they are only developed, they are only cultivated, they are motivated to work by use. Now, the stomach is like the most redundant part of the human body. Even your head, you cannot do without shaking your head about five or six times in one hour. Your stomach can remain in a dormant state for 24 hours without doing anything, while every other part of your body is working and doing something. Which is why it is very easy when you pass a particular heat to begin to accumulate uh, 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 fats in those parts of the human body. And you see why it is, it is so important for us to engage in exercise. So you see, the, uh, and, then, and then it becomes difficult. When even every other part of the body is losing the weight, it's like the stomach is not yet losing the weight. Why? The stomach, they said, it don't take away belly day for front. But it has never gone to the side or go to the back. It's just in a constant state of rest. So the muscles around your tummy, we call it stomach. That is not stomach. Stomach is not that part below your chest. The things below your chest, right, and your hip, between your chest and your hip, is more than stomach. So we just use that word stomach to talk about every other thing that is there. So it's more than the stomach. So all of these things are made sometimes of muscles, and these muscles need to be activated. When they are activated, it is then that they do their job very well. For example, within the, um, the large intestine, the large intestine reacts to some contractions in the stomach for stool and fecal materials to be passed through into the rectum, which is a process that must be carried out by every normal human being at least once in 24 hours. Your rectum must feel that there is a pressure there for bowel movement to take place. Now, at that point, the movement gap now becomes voluntary. You may choose to go to the toilet and you may choose to hold the poo in your system. Some people can hold poo in the system for three days. It doesn't just stay there. It can also go back into the system again. It can just flush back again and go. I will explain that while explaining the acid reflux uh, uh, relationship and the one of heartburn. So what I'm trying to say is that Exercise plays a role. And when you're not in motion, at least try to do certain things to help the muscles of your stomach so that your body can do what it should do. Because that contraction, when that tightening happens in the, within the large intestine, it makes the food to be formed. I mean, it's, okay, okay, okay. Let, let me calm down. <laughs> okay, it's like I'm going like a, a medical science class right now. Okay, when that contraction happens, Secretion takes place. Uh, it's like this, the, the, the liquid that has been passed into the food, when it becomes semi, semi solid substances from the esophagus to the stomach to the small intestine, the remaining secretion is taken out. So the food begins to form like solid material. It is that solid material that is now passed out to the rectum, which makes you go to the toilet for you to pull and pass everything out. So that is the journey that began from the mouth and is ending at the rectum, right? Somewhere along the line of the large intestine is one small sac called the appendix, which many people have said it doesn't have any role in place in the human body, blah, 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 but it's there. So it's part of the things that are in the large intestine. The small intestine processes the food, takes away the nutrient, passes whatever is waste in the large intestine, that filters it and sends everything that is a waste down to the rectum for it to be passed out and to exit the body. When this does not happen, or there is a compromise along the line, a whole lot of things could go wrong. And one of them is obesity. Autoimmune disorders too will happen. This is a case where the body's immune system begins to fight the body instead of fighting uh, invader cells from the human body. Neurological diseases too can come up. Brain and nervous system dysfunctionality can also happen. I've explained that in the course of this, as these are new discoveries telling us that we can regulate the gut health and at the same time help children or help people with cognitive disorders. So that is just to tell us what happened from my mouth down to the rectum and how these things affect the way we process food. So if your gut health is not in order, you can eat food, but you won't be able to absorb the nutrients. If you absorb the nutrients, the waste could stay there, and the, that will become recalcitrant. Uh, then it becomes a problem again in the system. And then when your body, your stomach is not well exercised, the muscles of the stomach walls are not being well exercised, it will be impossible for power movement to take place. So that is just a summary of all the grammar 
and all the benefit that gets. But don't worry. You just know, understand that if your gut hurt is not in order, you cannot lose weight properly. So that is just all I've been trying to say. Okay? So digestion starts from the mouth. So digestive enzymes are in saliva. So like I said earlier, chew your food and don't just swallow them. Um, on this point, I want to advise. A whole lot of us do mindless eating. And when I say mindless eating, we have our plate before us and we are just, it, it becomes, it, it has become a mechanical or like an automatic, automated process. You know where your mouth is. So you don't even, you don't even count how many spoons, how many times your, your spoon touches your plate and goes into your mouth any longer. Except um, Nepal takes the light. You know what you put on your plate. So some of us, while eating, we are reading. Some of us, while eating, we are gisting. Some of us, while eating, we're watching TV. So we, it's what I call mindless eating. So we are just eating. When we eat that way, some things are likely to happen. One of them is the fact that we may not even know uh, consciously or unconsciously our eating or feeding habit. It will take some other people who, who have been watching us or paying attention to us to tell us that why are you eating like that, right? Like it's like somebody who snores. Nobody knows. <laughs> this story is very funny. I had a couple uh, in a session with the couple and then the wife accused the husband of snoring. The wife said to the husband, you see why you should lose some weight? Because you snore. <laughs> the other said, me, I don't snore. You are the one who snore. You snore a lot. And they began to argue. You snore, you snore. They've been married for almost 25 years. Now, you know who's helped to settle this call? It was their first child. The child just came and said, Daddy and Mommy, both of you snore. You both snore. Because except you record yourself while sleeping, you wouldn't know you snore. Except someone tells you, you snore. Right? The same thing applies to mindless eating. You can be eating mindlessly and not pay attention to your eating pattern. Some people eat very fast. And when I use the word very fast, I mean very fast. It could be as a result of their upbringing, how they were, how they were raised. If you were raised in a family, probably you, you had a large family. Your father was trying to raise a soccer team. So you were about 24 in all. You had a football, you have a group, you have a coach, you have everybody in your family. You will, be, you will agree with me that your feeding pattern, your eating, the way you eat your food, will be different from somebody who was raised in a child that they are only trying to raise a table tennis team. They are just two, two of them. And then daddy, mommy, and the child, three. Maybe another sibling, making four. They are not struggling because if you are raised in a large family, there is that race that whoever finishes the food first can still go back and take whatever is left in the pot. I know, I know of a culture in Africa where everybody eats and so on. They, they eat on the mat and then they just have two bowls. One bowl will be for carbohydrate, one bowl for protein. And everybody eats, surrounds that big, large bowl and kneel down and they begin to eat their food. That is how they eat. Now, that is what is called uh, survival of the fittest. Um, ability to be satisfied in such a family will be based on your ability to, to eat how fast you can eat will determine how much of food you eat. So if you are the person who eats slowly, obviously you'll be growing thin and thin in such a family because People who are very fast eaters, when they have taken about three scoops of the food, you are still on your first one. So you have many people who grew up in such a home. And then now that life is better for them, they have not outgrown. Somebody saying for some of us, it's a body school. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a body school that some, some people attended. It's still there. So, so you know, so is that they are, now they are wealthy, they are well to do, they are here to recover from that eating, eating pattern. Poof on the table. I, I used to have, I used to know people who, they, no matter how hot the food is, no matter how hot the food is, you will think they have a cooler in their mouth. When you are still, when you are still trying, trying to blow, <laughs> blow the food, they have got everything in. you be like, ah, oh boy, you have cooler in your mouth. It's the way they were raised. It's a feeding pattern and they have not changed, right? Some of them, it is their children who will tell them, ah, daddy, it's very far. You know, some of these kids, 
they have a way of politely telling you something that could. <laughs> and some of them don't even care. They will just tell you to your face. You figure it out. And when they tell you, please oh, pay attention to what they are saying. Don't be too proud to change. The only way you can change that kind of pattern is when you change over and you begin to feed with your mind. You, are, you, 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 become, you become mindful with the way you eat. So when you put down your plate, be mindful. Determine the whole time. 20 minutes, 10 minutes to eat is not too much. So people grew up in a culture. For example, in America, in the Western culture, where it's like everybody eats on the go. In UK, you guys, British people say don't eat, you don't talk over lunch. That is not in America. America, billions, I mean, transactions worth billions of dollars. They are, they are settled at lunch. It is when eating, they do that. They talk at lunch, they can do anything over food. So they, they are eating and they are working, they're on the go. And that's why you see the prevalence of obesity in that culture. It is their culture. But it is not a good one. But you must be mindful of what you are putting into your mouth. You should look at every spoon of food, every scoop you take from your plate. Analyze before you put it in your mouth. And masticate enough. Chew it enough before you swallow it. Some of us don't do that. I mean, if some people throw up what they eat, you will find that it's like garbage in, garbage out. Everything is still intact. Everything. Is still, the way they took it from their plate, except that the rice has mixed with stew. That's what, so they will give you the love fries when they throw up. But the rice, no, the grains of rice, no breaking down. It is still intact. That is terribly wrong. So if they didn't throw it up, they have put a whole lot of body on their digestive system to begin to break down the food. First of all, break down the food. Have a good relationship with the way you undo your food. Oh my. Okay? The stomach is a temporary food storage. So the stomach holds food temporarily before it pushes the food out, which is another reason for you not to rush your food. Because if your, your small intestine is not ready to receive the food, your stomach will not push the food to your small intestine. Now, right on the base of the stomach, there is a sphincter that can open up. When it opens up, pressure is released, right, to push down the food down to the, uh, to the small intestine. This same pressure, I mean, this same opening, if it is closed, tells the rectum to open up, to apply pressure on the rectum for bowel movement to take place. If this, sorry, if these transactions are not happening at the right time, it is then people sleep. When they sleep, they say the food is coming back up on the, to their throat. Why? The stomach is holding up too much than it can handle per time. The small intestine probably is not ready to receive from the stomach. So when the small intestine is not ready, the stomach holds it. When the stomach can't hold because the stomach doesn't have the capacity to hold for too long a time, it wants to push it back into the throat so that it can come out again. Some people have that problem. Some have the problem of when they throw the food in, the stomach can't hold it, so it comes back. Some people down is not that, it's not that way because their small intestine is not ready to receive any food. That is why it holds on for them. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> Okay, so don't rush your food. Don't put more into your stomach than your stomach can undo per time. Now, the muscles in the small intestine, they control your bowel movement. I've explained this earlier. And so these muscles are impressed by using and they degenerate if they are inactive. So one thing to do is to practice stomach squeezes. What are stomach squeezes? Holding your stomach in. No matter how fat you are, no matter how fat your stomach is, Practice stomach squeezes regularly. Like you are breathing in, you are holding your breath in. If you do it for too long a time, you will feel like you're having stomach ache. And after you release it, you will feel like there's a pressure on your rectum to go to use the bathroom. What has happened there is that we've applied pressure on the large intestine. This is making them to secrete certain uh, 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 secretions that will make the, the, the food in the large intestine to flow down into the rectum. All of this will only happen if it is tightened. So when you tighten your stomach, it's all a, I mean, um, uh, an action that will revolve. They will all happen simultaneously. 
So you can try it at your own uh, uh, convenience. And then he's going to push it down. OK, am I missing? OK, so I'm talking about this sacrifice going back again. Yeah. All right, so I'll just give like um, advices and suggestions. And all of these are all in line with what our diet plan is for this week. For you to help your gut, eat whole, unprocessed, unrefined foods. I've spoken about whole foods, unprocessed foods. I've spoken about unrefined foods, grass-fed, free-range, or wild-caught animal protein. If you are going to eat protein at all, let's make sure they are grass-fed, free-range, or wild-caught fish. You, um, you know, wild-caught fish, you can find out about those ones. They are not fish that they, they use the chemicals to catch from the, from the river. A lot, a lot of them are like that. Number two, eat raw foods. Make 75% of your plate to be vegetables and plant-based foods. Eat good fats and get an oil change. I will say this again and again, that please do not bleach your oil. The moment you bleach your oil, again, you see, it's not a problem. Somebody say bush meat. Be careful yeah. for Ebola. <laughs> if you, <laughs> Ebola and coronavirus, yeah, SARS and Ebola. So be careful. Um, okay, Jenkins iPhone needs to be muted. Don't worry, I've done the muting. So eat good fats. Uh, I've recommended some oil that, that will be of great advantage. Palm oil is good. Nothing is wrong with it. People say palm oil makes you fat. It's because you bleach it, it becomes trans fat. When it becomes trans fat, it becomes poorly saturated. So you need mono and saturated fats. The example of those is the uh, fats that will give you omega-3. Uh, avocado is there. All extra, uh, the extra virgin cold press olive oil, the MCT oil. MCT oil is like is coconut oil, right? And you have so many of the cold pressed oil. They will help you. One of the things they do is that they remove inflammation. They are anti-inflammatory, right? Inflammation is at the at, at, at the bottom line of several conditions. You don't want to have inflammation. If you can handle inflammation, you handle so many disease conditions. Again, this is just for weight loss, weight management class. Register for the main health class. You need that one. I can't, this, this, I mean, this, this is like a two-hour class session, so I'm trying to rush over it right now. Register for that session. If you have not registered, send register to Adesua or send it to Plus one two one four six two four two seven eight three. I think that's the number. Send register NHC to that number so that you can be on that in that class, right? Remove inflammatory fats, poly saturated fats and trans fats. Add fiber rich foods, nuts, seeds, and then there is this one I will recommend if you are having issues with constipation, bloating, and gas, flatulence. You know, you you're on this program where it's called glucomannan. Glucomannan. It provides prebiotics. It fills the body with healthy bacteria. I would recommend it. So I'm not going to put it on the supplement list. Now people will not say how many supplements. But if you know you need it, it's good for your health. Go look for it. Glucomannan. And then send it across before you buy it. Let me check and be sure that it's a good one. Add fermented foods. We have added fermented foods to our meal for this, uh, for, the, for the meat plant for this week. Kimchi, tempeh, miso, a kefa, uh, plain, uh, plain milk, uh, plain yogurt, you know, uh, sucrose, all of those are all fermented foods. We have added them and included them. Thank you very much, everybody. I will not be able to take questions because I am already due for another class, another live session as I speak with you right now. Um, so what I will advise is that um, I will throw this slide also. I will put the slide on the group. If there are questions, put the questions on your group and tag me. I will come there to answer those questions. Thank you, everybody. I'm so sorry I won't be able to wait behind to answer questions, and I need to move to another live session right away. So I really apologize for that. If I'm about six minutes late for that next session, all right? It will be going on live. It's live on Facebook and it'll be live also on uh, the YouTube page for Infrastructure Health Solution. I'm talking to people who are in ministry, pastors about their health. This week, I'm talking to pastors about their health and um, what to help them to do with their health this week, or from Tuesday to Friday. Every, every hour that we are right now, I don't know, it's about 12 p.m. my own time. So every 12 p.m., if you know anybody who is a pastor 
who needs to, uh, not just pastors, people who are in ministry, whatever ministry they do, it could be their far, imam, anything that they are doing that has to do with religion, they are the people that will be facing this week, I'll be facing them very squarely. All right, thank you, everybody. Um, I will drop the slide on the group. Thank you for coming. Okay. I'm free to go, right? Yes, thank you, okay. sir. You see, why I need, you see why you need to come to that school right now? So that if I have such a class, I will just say, Mrs. Talabi, please go ahead and talk to those pastors. They will be fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you need to attend that training. All right, thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.